Hello and welcome to our online worship today. We are so glad that you have taken the time to join us in worship this morning. Now, today we are starting a brand new sermon series, thinking about what it is like to stand firm in a shifting world. Things seem like they're always changing and moving, but we do need to stand firm. And this Sunday, Pastor Phil is going to bring us a message specifically looking at where do we see Christ in the cancel culture today? So I'm looking forward to hearing what Pastor Phil has to say today and in the weeks to come. I would also like to welcome any of you who have come back and any of you who are new. I know there are new people joining us because uh, this week, we just got past 100 subscribers on our YouTube channel. So thank you for subscribing and being a part of our online community. And if you have never connected with us before, we do encourage you to be in touch with myself or Pastor Phil and uh, ask any questions you have. And we would love to start a dialogue. And we do have a gift to welcome you. I'd also like to let you know there are several opportunities to be involved at Westview and we still have online groups. We have groups that connect over the phone and Alpha started just a couple weeks ago on Monday nights and I believe there is still room for you to join in if you would like to dig a little deeper into your faith and try to figure out what Christianity means. I would also like to let you know that uh, we have some things that have been happening in our youth group. Last week we had Avalanche, which was our junior high retreat, and it was online. And those of us who were able to make it really enjoyed it. We had a great time. And our senior highs have an opportunity on the weekend of February 5th to join in for Blizzard. So if you haven't been in touch with me yet, please let me know if you would like to join us with this online experience. Now to get our hearts and mind focused as we prepare to worship, we have a reading that comes from Psalm 18, verses 30 through 33, which read, As for God, his way is perfect. The Lord's word is flawless. He shields all who take refuge in him. For who is God besides the Lord? And who is the rock except our God? It is God who arms me with strength and keeps my way secure. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He causes me to stand on the heights. And now, let us worship our Lord and Savior in song.
Well, today I'm doing some artwork. You know, I really enjoy painting, uh, but sometimes I like to sketch. It's kind of nice and simple to sketch because, well, all you need is a paper and a pencil. But an important part on the pencil is the eraser as well. If I think about different kinds of artwork that I could do, one form of artwork I really don't like is using a charcoal pencil. Now that is a pencil that I can't erase and I don't know what to do with that when I make a mistake. I mean, I actually make quite a few mistakes and the eraser on the end of my pencil is important. This big eraser comes in handy and I even have a special eraser that will fit into tiny corners. So with a pencil, you can erase your work. I mean, this piece that I'm working on, there's a horse on here. And if I went with my first marks, I think my horse would have looked kind of funny. But this eraser is very forgiving with all the mistakes that I make along the way. So when I make a mistake, I can start over and do a better job. Now, I think this pencil is a little bit like us as we go through life. I mean, we have a story that we write, we have words that we share and things that we do. We make marks in our life. And well, sometimes the things that we say and the things that we do aren't the best things to say or do. And sometimes we want to take those back. And you know, God gives us the opportunity to ask for forgiveness for those things that we do that are sins. If we come to God and we ask him for forgiveness, he will forgive us. In the Bible, in Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 and 22, we see that Peter talks to Jesus and he goes up to Jesus and he says, now how many times should I forgive? Seven? Well, I mean, he throws the number seven out there because that sounds like a lot of times to forgive somebody. Well, this is what Jesus says in response. He says, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Can you imagine having to forgive somebody that many times? It seems like a lot. But when I look at my artwork, I've erased quite a few times and I'm really glad that I was able to make all those corrections. And you know, we're going to make a lot of mistakes in our lives and we need to ask God for forgiveness and we know that God will forgive us even if it's 77 times. So I want to encourage you, if there's something that you've done that you need forgiveness for, ask God for that forgiveness, but also show others Jesus's love when someone does something wrong to you and forgive them for the things that they have done as well. Because our God is a God who loves and a God who forgives.
Good morning. We are Charlotte and Ken Van Roostel, and we are going to read the scripture reading this morning. Galatians 1, 11 to 24. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when God, who set me apart from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles, my immediate response was not to consult any human being. I did not go up to Jerusalem to see those who were apostles before I was, but I went into Arabia. Later, I returned to Damascus. Then, after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to get acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him for 15 days. I saw none of the other apostles, only James, the Lord's brother. I assure you before God that what I am writing you is no lie. Then I went to Syria and Cilicia. I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that were in Christ. They only heard the report. The man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they praised God because of me. 1 Timothy 1.15.16 here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Thanks for joining us again today. We are so delighted that we can be together here to worship, even if it's like this. Today, we start a new series called Stand Firm. And as we look at this series, what we're looking at is the fact that in Christ, we are offered freedom. God gives us freedom. But ironically, we also have to stand our ground because there are forces all around us that want to pull us away from the very things that give us freedom. And we can look in the book of Galatians chapter 5 verse 1 to hear about this where the apostle Paul, one of the early church leaders, writes this. He says, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. God has set you free, so don't go back to where you were. And Today in our culture, we have all sorts of pressures outside in the, the culture of the world around us. And for those of us who are Christians, who are followers of Jesus Christ, we can also see those powers and those influences at work inside the church too. And so we're going to look at this book of Galatians, which is a letter that Paul wrote to a church in a place called Galatia, uh, what we would call modern day Turkey. And he writes to believers who started off trusting in this good news of Jesus Christ, but then were influenced in a different direction so that they were losing the freedom that God wanted for them. Today in particular, I want us to look at what it means to follow Christ in a cancel culture. Now, what do I mean by a cancel culture? Some of you will know right away, some of you won't. But a cancel culture basically is where we find a means to drag somebody down in status, influence, power, because they have stepped over a line that we feel they shouldn't have. Now, in some cases, it's probably something that we can all agree on that they shouldn't have done. 
uh, and they do need to be held accountable for it. But in some cases, it can be people going absolutely rogue. Not that long ago, I heard about a doctor who, um, on the window outside his office, had a, a, a sign posted. Now, the sign was just a piece of paper printed out, posted on the outside of the window, which should have been uh, a clue as to where it came from. But the, the sign basically said that this doctor was being investigated uh, by the College of Physicians and therefore nobody should go and see this doctor. When you looked up the doctor's name, because it was on the sign, and when you looked up the doctor's name, uh, there was nothing in the news, certainly nothing from the College of Physicians warning people to stay away. But what you had was a patient or somebody close to this doctor who wanted to ruin their reputation and was doing so by their own means, by smearing their reputation, by putting a sign up so that others could see. Uh, that same sign was also photographed and put on social media. So the word got out, whether it was true or whether it wasn't, it certainly didn't seem to be true. But, you know, that person wanted to drag them down. Cancel culture tries to put pressure on people so that they will recant something that they have said or done, so that they will lose influence or power. And ultimately, it's so that uh, the culture that somebody who's doing the canceling, the culture that they want to promote, gets a boost. Now, we can, we have to admit, first of all, that there is a need in our world today for critique. And there is a need for us to be able to contain things that are toxic. We have to identify them and contain them. Um, but cancel culture gives anybody the power to do that to anyone for any reason. And Honestly, cancel culture can go to such an extreme, but, but why would we take it to an extreme? Uh, Rob Henderson, who writes for Psychology Today, talks about our love of cancel culture. And he points out a number of things that we gravitate towards. One is power. It gives us power. I, I have to say, there, there is a place for offering power to the powerless. And, and some would argue that cancel culture does just that. It gives people who feel that they don't have a voice, maybe in government, maybe in other official institutions or, or means of, of getting things done, like a college of physicians. It gives those little people people who feel that they have no other means to resort to, it gives them power. They can post something on social media to get the word out and make it known that an injustice has happened. But we have to be so careful with that. Power goes to our heads, even to those who would call themselves powerless. It also, cancel culture also gives us social status. It gives us a boost. You see, you can gain social status these days by doing good things, by being the kind of person who makes a positive difference in the world around us. But that takes a lot of work, a lot of effort, and a lot of time. You can get a quick boost in social status by tearing somebody else down. Tear them down, you get to replace them, almost. And what you get as well as the the boost in social status is you get a group of followers who are equally upset, incensed by what you've pointed out, and suddenly you've got a community around you, a community based on mutual dislike. It also promises us immediate gratification. And that's what most of us want. We don't want change tomorrow, we want it today. So there is a reason why we gravitate towards this idea of cancel culture. But honestly, this isn't something that's new. This has gone on through the generations. You can actually look at how it was done in places like ancient Egypt, ancient Mesopotamia, ancient Mesoamerica, places and cultures so different from our own, and yet still human beings involved, 
And so there were times when one pharaoh would die and the next pharaoh would come along and that pharaoh would actually intentionally send people out to deface any of the statues and images of the previous pharaoh. Uh, they would uh, want to try to make it look like that last pharaoh was nothing compared to them. It was a way of lowering that the, the reputation, but also the influence of that previous pharaoh while giving yourself a boost. And it happened in these other cultures as well. It's nothing new. But the, the reality is that in a cancel culture, nobody wins. You see, if you climb over somebody else to get to the top, you've just created other people underneath you who are now angry at you and will be looking for a way to topple you. It becomes a cycle, a vicious cycle that we live with. And that's not a solution that we can live with long term. Cancel culture ultimately is based on the assumption that there are good people and there are bad people. And you are assuming yourself that you're one of the good people. And you're assuming that when you cancel somebody that they're one of the bad people. But what would happen a week from now, a month from now, when somebody finds out something about you that they don't like? You see, part of the problem is that there is no standard definition of what is good and what's bad. Depending on what group you belong to, depending on what you're passionate about, you will have a different definition of good people and bad people. And so we have clashes today online and in person between people who are defining each other as bad people and defining themselves as good. This is a no-win situation. But thankfully, there is an alternative. In the gospel of Jesus Christ, in what Jesus has offered to us, we have a different assumption that we base life on. And it's not the assumption that there are good people and bad people. It's the assumption that there are sinful people, period. It names the fact that all of us have fallen short of what God has required of us. Not one person who has lived or will live or is living now has measured up to what God has asked of us except Jesus Christ. Jesus, who was both human and God in the flesh, he lived the life that we were intended to live. And all of the rest of us struggle to try to live even a part of that life. We fall short. We sin. We do things, say things, and think things that go against what God has asked of us that cause hurt to other people around us or harm even to ourselves. We are sinful. And because we're all in the same boat, how can we go canceling somebody else? Paul owns up to the sinfulness uh, in the second passage that we read this morning in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 15 and 16. He says, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I'm the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. Paul fully accepts his own sinfulness, that he is the same as everybody else. But what that was a sharp contrast from the kind of life he had lived before. Before he was a Christian, he was living a life where he was trying to live the perfect religious life. And he was canceling people who he felt didn't measure up. He was actually going around and arresting and at times making sure that they were killed, these new Christians, these followers of Jesus Christ. In his mind, they didn't measure up. They were the bad people and he was the good person. But when he met Jesus Christ, he became aware of his own sinfulness. And suddenly he viewed humanity in a different light. And other people weren't there to be canceled. Paul, in the letter 
to the Galatians is actually defending himself because he is now being canceled. People have come to this church in Galatia and have started telling the people there, the Christians there, that what Paul told them isn't right. That in order to be a Christian, you first need to be a good person. You need to follow the rules that they prescribed. And Paul has to write and say, listen, if you go along with what they say, then you're ignoring everything that Jesus stands for, including that we are all sinful. There aren't good people and bad people. We all just need the grace of Jesus Christ. In verse 11 and 12, the first two verses of this passage we read out of Galatians today, he defends some of the accusations that are coming his way by those who are trying to cancel him. Because they're telling the people in Galatia that he's not a real apostle for one thing, but they're also telling them that the message he preached was just a made up human message. And so Paul says, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. And he goes on from there to describe events that followed and how it wasn't other people who influenced what he believed. He hung on to what he had heard and experienced through Jesus Christ. His message wasn't human. His message was from God and he stood firm in it. And he's asking the Galatians to stand firm in that message that they had received, that we are all sinners and that we are rescued by Jesus. You see, in the church, we can sometimes get it turned around. We can sometimes receive God's mercy and grace for ourselves, forgiveness of sins, and then as we live our lives trying to live up to God's standards, knowing that we're accepted already, we start to look at others as though they need to measure up. And slowly this idea of good people and bad people starts to seep into our thinking, our decision-making, and the way that we live and speak. But the gospel is rooted in the fact that we are all sinners. We can't cancel another person without canceling ourselves as well, unless we're gonna do a huge cover-up job, but any cover-up job can be exposed. And as Paul goes through this passage, he also mentions that he was the kind of person who should have been canceled by the church. In verses 22 to 24, he says, I was personally unknown to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. They only heard the report. The man who formerly persecuted us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy. And they praised God because of me. They could have been afraid. They could have shunned him. In fact, at one point, they did try to keep him out. They were, they were afraid. But someone who understood the sinfulness of humanity and the grace of God in Jesus Christ stood with Paul and brought him into the church where he was welcomed and accepted because that's what the church is intended to be and unfortunately falls far short all too often. We are intended to be a people who understand the sinfulness of ourselves first and also all other people. So rather than canceling, we offer grace, the same grace that we have received. Paul does hold people accountable. And again, in the book of Galatians, we see it. He is railing against the teaching of these people who are trying to cancel him. But he's leaving them in God's hands. In chapter 1, verse 9, he says, As we've already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let them be under God's curse. In other words, these people who are telling you, you get into God's kingdom by your efforts, by being good, God will deal with them. But don't you follow them. Stand firm 
in your understanding of your own sinfulness and of God's incredible grace. So let me ask you, who are you tempted to cancel? Who have you canceled? Who are the people that you have deleted from your life? And maybe people who you have subtly or overtly told others to cancel from their life. People who you feel have hurt you so badly or hurt others so badly that they should just be pushed to the sidelines. I'm here to tell you that where that exists in your life, it's time to look again at yourself. And just as Paul said, to own up that I am the worst of sinners. I have in me the things that should have me canceled from God, from the church, from my fellow human being. But by the grace of God, he wants to invite me in. He wants me as I own up to my own sinfulness to forgive me and then to begin leading me on a new life where, yes, I learn how to bit by bit and very fumblingly to live the way he's asked me to live. But where I also extend the same grace to others that I have received. Rather than clambering over other people to be at the top and name others who are at the bottom, I look at humanity as us all standing on the same level ground. So as you look at relationships in your life, as you look at your use of social media, as you look at the news that's going on and the people or groups that you want to cancel, stop and consider that you are as sinful as they are. And you might want to even ask yourself, what reason would they have to cancel me? Canceling them will not change you or this world that we live in. And as much as the world around us wants to, to make us believe that it will, that it will help, that it will advance the cause, whatever the cause may be, it only creates more angry people and more cancellation. Instead, we need to look to the one who understands it better than we do, Jesus Christ. Jesus was canceled. His life was deleted because the people around him didn't like what they heard and what they saw. But he came back and he forgave and he invited people to follow him into the kingdom he was establishing and that he still is establishing. Let the master of change come into your heart as you own up to the sinfulness that's in you. And as he forgives and changes you, let that change the way you look at others and the way that you use social media, the way that you use your speech. There aren't good people and bad people. There are sinful people. And you and I are two of them. Jesus Christ came to welcome us in. Let's use the grace that he has offered to us to be a part of a better change in this world. But it requires that we stand firm in the grace of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you should have, could have, still could have every right to cancel us because we have fallen so far short of what you created us for. But that's not who you are. You have come to show us mercy. In fact, you let us cancel you so that you could come back and offer us the life we don't deserve. Lord, today, if we who are listening are those who have experienced and accepted your mercy, help us today to extend it as well. To examine our hearts for the places where we are deleting others and instead to open the door and to leave it open. 
Yes, to hold people accountable. Yes, to name the truth. But Lord, beyond that is up to you and you have called us to live lives of mercy. And Lord, if someone is listening today who has not experienced that mercy in their life, maybe they're canceling others because they're so deeply ashamed of the things that are inside of them. Maybe they're canceling others to try to feel better about themselves, but Lord, it's not working. Lord, would you come and speak to their hearts today? Would you offer mercy and acceptance and offer to turn their life around from a, a life of canceling and deleting to a life of mercy and grace? Lord, we offer ourselves to you. In your name we pray. Amen.
today as we prepare to go back into our day having worshiped together, let me send you with a blessing from 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong, do everything in love, and may the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you.